Have you ever thought that something like a project or a job or a relationship, something that really mattered to you, was going really well, but then suddenly everything seemed to fall apart? I feel like that's kind of been the story of my life this year. At the beginning of September, things were looking pretty good. I'd just started a PhD program after several years, uh, and after several years of spinning my wheels in campus ministry, I had launched a successful program and we were entering into our second year. The weekly dinner that many of you have been helping with over the last year or so. Then, right when everything was getting off the ground, I was badly injured. Initially, I harbored the false hope that I could get back to my normal activities after a week or two. I ended up being housebound for the entire fall semester. Even worse for me than the physical injuries was the mental fogginess that made it hard to think or concentrate or make decisions. None of this was part of my plan. Everything seemed to be falling apart. This morning, we heard a passage from 2 Corinthians, a letter that Paul writes to the church in Corinth when everything seems to be falling apart. Paul had previously spent a year and a half in Corinth, sharing the gospel and forming a church community. By the time he left, the church community in Corinth seemed to be really strong, and Paul also felt like he had a really strong relationship with the people there. As Paul continued on to take the gospel to new places, he stayed in touch with the church in Corinth through letters. Unfortunately, the church wasn't quite as strong as Paul had thought. He wrote 1 Corinthians to address several areas of conflict among people in the church, along with theological questions. However, after that letter sometime, uh, it also became clear that Paul's relationship with the Corinthians wasn't too solid. 2 Corinthians is his attempt to salvage a relationship that has become increasingly strained. So what's been going on while Paul's been away? It might help to think of first century Christianity as kind of the wild west of the church. None of the Gospels had been written yet, so there was no established story of Jesus' life, let alone the theology to understand it. There were also quite a lot of people around who felt called to share and spread the Gospel after they had come to believe it themselves, often without any kind of relationship with one another or with the apostles who had known Jesus while he was alive. It's no surprise, then, that Paul wasn't the only one to go to Corinth to preach and teach. It seems like some of these other folks who had come to Corinth after him disagreed with Paul on various theological topics, and they even called his authority into question because he didn't do any flashy miracles. That wasn't his style. Paul was upset on his own behalf when the church started to doubt him. But he was also concerned that the Corinthians would start to believe in a false theology instead of the true gospel. In other words, both his relationship with the church and the hard work he put into converting and teaching them seemed like they were unraveling. He felt like he needed to do something, but the last time he'd visited in person, it really hadn't gone very well. So he decides to write a letter. But if you've ever tried to resolve a conflict over email or text, you know how hard it is to do that. Without being able to hear someone's tone and inflection, written words can be misinterpreted and add more fuel to the fire, rather than helping to put it out. Paul has to choose his words carefully if he hopes to be reconciled with the Corinthian church. In this morning's reading, he owns his own weakness and limitations, in some ways accepting the criticisms of the people who had come after him and that had leveled these critiques of his approach. 
He makes his weakness part of his testimony. After all, he says, flashy miracles draw attention to the person who performs the miracle, not to the God who enables it. As Paul says, we're not in the business of proclaiming ourselves. It's not about us. It's about Jesus, proclaiming him and making him visible in our lives. Then he turns to the question of theology by focusing on the God who said, let light shine out of darkness. In this, we hear the resonance of that first day of creation when God calls forth life, light out of darkness, creating day and night. We also hear echoes of the first chapter of John, that passage that we read each Christmas, the light that shone in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. That living light is the source of our knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But here is where Paul shares what is really good news for us in this passage. That light of God, present from creation, present in Christ, has been shared with us too. It is this treasure that Paul refers to, God in us. Of course, Paul is quick to say that we have this treasure in clay jars. It doesn't mean that life is going to be easy. These clay jars are fragile. They're prone to chip and crack. This is what it means to be a human being, living in these in-between times, after the resurrection, but before the fulfillment of God's reign. It means living with the strength of the Holy Spirit and the weakness of human frailty, all at once in one contradictory package. That's why Paul can describe us as afflicted, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Of course, most of us have probably had times when we felt crushed or forsaken, when we were driven to despair. Thankfully, these moments are only part of the story, not the whole story. They are also moments that Jesus shared with us, ways that we carry in our mortal bodies, the death of Jesus, who was persecuted and afflicted, who cried out in despair, asking why God had forsaken him, who was indeed struck down, and yet Christ did not stay struck down. He is alive, and so we carry the death of Jesus in our bodies so that the life of Jesus can be made visible. We are a resurrected people, not an immortal people. I've never felt my mortality more acutely as I did this year. There's something incredibly vulnerable about being wheeled into an operating room. In our culture, there's also something incredibly vulnerable about admitting that you can't do it all, that you need help. Yet, when everything fell apart for me, it created an opening for grace. My professors and classmates were generous and compassionate, making it possible for me to continue my studies while I was stranded at home. Volunteers from here at church and from campus came forward to keep the food ministry at MIT going. When I stopped being the strong one, it created space for people to show me that they care to show up for one another. I met the living Christ in the hands that helped in the words and expressions of solidarity. It was only when my clay jar cracked that I could see the light inside. And so a weird thing happened. When everything fell apart, I didn't fall apart. I really expected to. I've never been particularly good at that keep calm and carry on thing. And they don't call it trauma surgery for nothing, let alone five surgeries in eight months. Bad things kept happening. I was often perplexed, 
but I can't remember any despair. And I can only chalk that up to God because my own strength was pretty tapped out. God's strength shone through my brokenness. But that only speaks to my own experience. Part of what Paul is telling us is that our brokenness allows God's light to shine out to others too. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. In other words, our vulnerability doesn't just open us to receiving love and compassion from others, but it softens us to be better beacons of love and compassion to others. My own experience of brokenness both allows me a clearer window into other people's experiences, but my willingness to be vulnerable allows me to share that compassion more directly and clearly. In Leonard Cohen's song called Anthem, he tells us, forget your perfect offering. There are cracks in everything. That's how the light gets in. Paul would add, that's how the light gets out. We are all human beings, flawed and fragile. We aren't expected to be perfect. Only God is perfect. In fact, our own brokenness can be an unexpected gift, allowing us to see the light of God's love in us, to receive it from others, and to extend it to others. When we seem perfect, it's kind of like proclaiming ourselves. We get the credit. When we are vulnerable, we proclaim the God who is our strength in weakness, and we become beacons of and witnesses to God's love. Brene Brown has described courage, compassion, and connection as the gifts of imperfection. In other words, when we stop trying to be perfect, we grow our courage We expand our compassion, and we strengthen our connection to one another. What would it be like if we all stopped seeing imperfection as inadequacy and instead embraced our human limitations like Paul does as a way of creating space for God and Christ to become more visible in and through us? I invite you into the spiritual practice of embracing human frailty as a gift, to accept others' love and support in response to your broken places, and to extend love and compassion toward others in their brokenness too. In doing so, we meet Christ in one another. Will you pray with me? God, we give you thanks for the light that you created out of darkness, for the light that is in Christ and that Christ has given to us, the light that darkness cannot overcome. When we feel fragile and broken, help us to feel that light inside, to open ourselves to one another. And when we see hurt or brokenness in others, give us the grace and the love to extend your love to them. We pray this in your name. Amen.